Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. Welcome to folks who are here in person and folks who are here online. We're recording the event. Please turn off your phones and all that stuff. I'm Judith Kelly. I'm the Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy, and I'm really glad to welcome you to the Wilson Lecture. And um, I would like to start by thanking the student groups that we have worked with, uh, the Policy and Living Color Group. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Africa Policy Group. Yay! Are you the same group? <laughs> and the Duke Africa Professional and Graduate Student Union. Yay! <laughs> and we've also received support from other sources like the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, Duke Human Rights Center, the Nicholas School Energy Club, and the Environmental Justice Oral History Project. And so I want to thank all of those and uh, the folks that have put in all the efforts to organize the event today. Um, we're going to start out with having an address from our keynote, whom I'll introduce just very shortly. And then there'll be a brief fireside chat between some other special guests. And then there'll be a Q&A at the end with everybody on the stage. So we are up for some fun. Are you ready? Yeah, you are. Awesome. It's really great to, have, to be doing this because this is also like, um, uh, it's also um, Earth Month, generally, at Duke. And uh, as, as you may know, we also have uh, a, an MPP in uh, energy and environment here, and students can come here and study uh, energy and the environment and climate and these kinds of issues uh, if they're a PhD program or as an undergraduate student. So um, it's really great to have this event today to highlight some of those things as well. Okay, now to our speaker. Our speaker is Rhea Salter. Rhea is an attorney. Uh, a consultant, an educator, and a clean energy law and policy expert with a focus on energy and climate justice. And she founded something called Energy Justice Law and Policy Center. She's also a member of the New York State Climate Action Council, which is a body that developed New York's um, plan to implement its sort of nation-leading climate law that they have in New York. And on top of that, she advises the White House Oversight Committee and the House Natural Resources Committee and has testified twice before Congress, which some of you may have seen, as that was a rather interesting exchange uh, in which if you ever need to learn how to stand your ground, you want to watch. Um, and uh, uh, her testimony in front of Congress was about environmental justice and big oil misinformation. So she has a lot of experience and um, she's working for some of the uh, most prominent firms in the country and uh, social service organizations and we're just really thrilled to welcome her. So I am counting on you to give her like the biggest welcome ever. So let's go for it. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here with you today. I want to thank everyone who made this possible for me to be here. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Dean Kelly, for that hype introduction. Thank you to all the staff, Cameron, my other distinguished panelists, for being here today. I wonder, yeah, I guess it can stay here, but also I can, maybe it can be here too. Um, and also, I came here straight from um, the middle of Arizona. I was at Greenpeace's direct action camp. Um, so yes, I was roughing it in the middle of Arizona. And yes, I learned how to climb flagpoles. I learned how to build blockades. Um, so if you need a flag taken down, you can let me know. <laughs> I will add it to my action list. Also, thank you to that JB Duke. The salmon bowl was lit. The hot water was lit. I was extremely happy to have a hot shower, and I am here with you. 
Okay, so what I want to begin talking with you about today is what I think I like to think of as an important welcome. And it's a welcome about the climate movement. Um, so I'm going to talk about the welcome to the climate movement. Then I'm going to talk about what I consider to be some barriers to climate action. And then though, before we get too depressed about it, we will then talk about some solutions to overcome those barriers. And I promise at that point, I will also get a little bit to community owned energy systems, like at least just a little bit. All right, does that sound okay with all of you wonderful people? Okay, fantastic. So the welcome that I wanted to talk about, I really wanna welcome each and every one of you. Welcome to the dawn. Welcome to the dawn of the climate movement. And for illustration, I wanna do just a little bit, a little exercise. Do we have folks, we may not have that many folks here, who are 50 and over? Like raise your hand if you're 50 and over, and are somebody who cares about the environment and has, oh, did you put your hand down when I said you cared about the environment? <laughs> Like, I know you didn't um, care about the environment. And when you were in your teens and 20s, what was the issue, the main issue that you were focused on? If somebody is willing to, or if something you were concerned about in the environment for our older crew? Pollution, pollution. Hello, thank you. I was very activated myself in the 80s by the nuclear proliferation issue, which is also an awesome activist thing to talk about. But point being, is that not a single one of us were focused on global warming, right? Um, so now anybody, no matter how old you are, raise your hand if you're concerned about the climate crisis and intend to work on areas of solutions or interested in activism. And so I figured we'd have, Ms. Angela, I'm sure that's one of you, you just ain't raising your hand, but I know you feel that way, and I'm sure you do, Ms. Ms. Cameron. So that's exactly my point. And I want to talk a little bit about welcome to the dawn of the climate movement, because some of you have grown up with the idea about the climate crisis, but only those of us who were younger. And why? Why? Any volunteers on why this is the case? Don't just jump in with the, with the engagement and the participation. You're like, we just came from class to avoid this crap. <laughs> but I understand. Well, I'll answer it. Because we didn't know, right? How could we? Be, go ahead. Thank you, and that's exactly what we're gonna talk about, right? Because we didn't know. We didn't know. So we knew scientists in the 1980s figured out this was gonna be a problem. Um, one famous moment is when Dr. James Hansen, a NASA scientist, went to testify before Congress in 1988 and told the US government and the entire world that there, you know, Houston, I guess literally Houston, there is a problem, um, the climate is changing. But another important detail that was described by this um, gentleman over here is that Exxon knew. Exxon and other folks like them knew. And just this fall, the House Oversight Committee had hearings on exactly this, big oil lies and misinformation. They came out with an excellent report. I encourage folks to look at it. And they found among other things that Exxon and the other major oil companies have known at least since the 80s that their products were causing the climate crisis. Not only did they know, but they knew with stunning precision what the trajectory would look like. And I, you know, you see the graphs from the 80s and it shows exactly where our GHGs are to now. So they knew about the timeline and instead of exposing that timeline to daylight, what did they do? They led a big tobacco style information campaign to hide the truth and inspire confidence and care into their products. Now, hundreds of cities and states are suing them right now because of this. Um, but it's something that they still do to this very day on the scale of billions and billions of dollars of marketing and advertising. And that's a whole nother conversation to go into that. They want you to think that their products are wholesome and that they are focused on sustainability. In your gut, is that true? No. no. But this is, you know, they, this is the, the information war that they are waging. And of course, as was alluded to by your dean, thank you, I myself testified at that hearing. I was asked to provide information on this big oil misinformation, lies, the way they lie about their climate pledges, um, and the 
resulting environmental injustice that their products cause. And the truth is, is when you poke the beast, you reap a whirlwind. When you poke the misinformation beast, you reap the whirlwind. So yes, I was confronted by a congressman from Louisiana, which many folks know is home and he represents Cancer Alley, which is some, so we call Cancer Alley, which is basically one of the best known it's not a good thing to be famous for, and I don't want to speak about it like that, but it's one of the best known, you know, sort of um, environmental injustice touch points like in the country in terms of being well known. So I'm there talking about the environmental injustice caused by the petrochemical industry, and Mr. Louisiana um, decides that he wants to come up and really just take his time to disrespect me to try and distract from the issue. Now, that's all right, because I told him how his actions were hard, hurting his own poor black and brown constituents. At one point, I had to tell him to actually repent. Um, and I also told him uh, that the fossil fuel industry that owns his state is destroying the earth and the natural world. So I got back to him on those things. But he disrespected me. He called me boo and some other things that were ridiculous. Now, after our wonderful New York woo, woo, um, AOC, um, Rep. Andrea Ocasio-Cortez, wasn't having any of this. So she jumped in and was apologized to me for the circus that he caused. But after that, because it was AOC and everything, it went viral. But I mention it because basically this representative was rewarded because Tucker Carlson himself invited him on his show to talk about this and call me a moron and importantly call me un-American, which we know is very dangerous. And so while I take it as a bit of a point of pride that I had my own Tucker Carlson takedown segment, you know, I mean, that's a badge of honor in a way. Um, when you poke this information machine, it is swift and it is ruthless in coming for you because it doesn't want America. Of course, we are the world's number one uh, producer of oil and the largest um, historical greenhouse gas emitter to wake up and grapple with what we're doing. Okay, fast forward, we're still talking about this timeline in terms of who knew, who's trying to hide the truth. So now we know the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the world scientists, have told us that this is the most decisive decade in human history. Um, just last year, the sixth cycle assessment, academics don't name things that make it easy to say. You know, sixth cycle assessment, told us that the impacts of the climate crisis led by the burning of fossil fuels is causing changes that we can't stop, is causing um, harm to communities in this country and throughout the global south, drought, famine, extreme temperatures, and that really we, only, we aren't gonna be able to stop the worst of it from happening, but we do have 10 years to avert the worst of those climate impacts. So yes, the climate crisis is urgent, but another thing just in terms of emergent, so it makes sense that we have really increased as, you know, as humans, increased our GHG emissions since the Industrial Revolution, right? Like we was kind of, I guess, more chilling with nature. Then we went, you know, invented some cars and planes and all these things. And sort of that's when, you know, trains like the lion's share of the greenhouse gases came. But it's important to understand that the real exponential growth in terms of um, mass emissions has really happened since the 80s and 90s. So when you look at the graph, this isn't a, you took me away from my slides this time, but you see it edging up, you know, from 1850, da, 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 in the 80s, it shoots up towards exponential growth. So that's a point that I want to make, and of course, according to the International Energy Association, or is it the administration? I always forget. IEA, global related um, carbon emissions are at their highest levels than they have ever been in the history of the world. So the point I'm making here is that this crisis is urgent, but in our lifetimes. And the reason for this, the culprit, is lies uh, misinformation, and also, I very strongly believe, a limited culture, uh, limited cultures and practices of awareness, you know, about the issue. So what do I mean by cultures of awareness? 
Um, well, the truth is, is that a lot of people are aware that there is a climate crisis. Um, according to the Yale Program on Climate Communications, 53% of Americans are alarmed or concerned about global warming. Now, that's a lot, but the remaining folks are either dismissive, doubtful, or disengaged. You know, and since 2012, the folks who have gone from concern to alarm, we have more people who are alarmed, but the folks who are disinterested, disengaged, and doubtful, that remain pretty much about the same. So it won't surprise you that Gen Z and millennials are, are um, uh, more likely to be alarmed or concerned. But get this, according to Yale's polling work, Latinx, Hispanic, and black people are more likely to be alarm and concern. People of color, in particular, women of color, are most likely to be alarmed. We alarm, y'all, we very alarmed. Um, white adults are most likely to be doubtful and dismissive, but still, we got our alarmed, but we got a big, you know, group of people who are, aren't just particularly, you know, have that on their highest priority list. Now, I get this. You know, I don't necessarily blame people for this. People are out here trying to, like, live their lives, and we all know that it's hard enough. You don't see a lot of coverage about these issues in the media. Um, there really isn't an ongoing or iterative way for people to engage with information about the climate crisis in practical or culturally relevant ways. I mean, there just isn't, right? Like, you know, there'll be a storm, and that's when you turn on the TV and there's someone in a raincoat, you know, by the water being like, here's, you know, and that's kind of where it stops. But this year, we had some really strange weather. That, well, stop texting. I hope you listen in. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I know he is in the front row texting. Excuse, excuse me. Where was I? Excuse me. But this year we've had some, <laughs> some particularly wacky weather, right? I feel like this year more than any year, you walk around and see people muttering, right? Like, why is it, you know, snowing in California? Why is it hot in New York winter? Everyone's like, must be that climate change. Must be that climate change. And, you know, I spoke to one person who said, I think it's because we have satellites and rockets that are going like up and down and they messing up the atmosphere. And I was like, hmm, I actually, I don't know about that theory. So I actually asked a climatologist who I happen to know about that theory and she agreed that the, the idea of like rockets themselves, like messing up the atmosphere probably wasn't very like likely. But she did say that in essence, and don't come for me, I'm not the climatologist, in essence, climate disturbance, including the impacts of global warming, do cause a kind of climate chaos that contribute to some of this like freaky deaky weather that we've been having. So while there's this existential angst about the climate crisis and weird weather, we don't really have these cultures of awareness to inform us about it, to keep us aware of how to address it and keep us up to date on the things that we can do on a practical level to address both the causes and also survive the impacts. Why, again, would we say? You know, apathy is driven by lies. Lies about recycling, particularly in plastics, right? Like, we know, Exxon knows, Coca-Cola and Procter and & Gamble know, that they can't really recycle all that we're doing here. They know they can't recycle that plastic, that it's actually not, you know, it's not solid enough to become something again, and that it's never going to happen. They know. And they use that myth so they can continue to make the plastic, which of course is made out of oil from facilities that cause environmental injustice and end up in our ocean is a big problem. Also lies about carbon footprint. You know, this idea that um, we have uh, individuals need to focus on what our carbon footprints are. So yes, it's important, very important what we do as individual people and actions. I'm activist, I would always acknowledge that. Um, but the idea of a carbon footprint was very much incentivized by the fossil fuel industry. Why? Because it makes it seem like it's your fault and you're not actually looking at waking up to, to what's going on. So what we've been talking about, the climate movement is not really a thing. 
It's a baby, it's emergent. And second, we have a cultural problem and misin a misinformation problem that's almost as big as our climate problem. And imagine, Imagine instead we had a culture focused on education and climate empowerment for all citizens, including real-time information and how to take action on adaptation and mitigation. And we were just like, you know, on all fronts, kumbaya, loving on each other in some climate world. I love that. We love to see it. Well, that brings me to number three. What if we don't have a climate problem? but we also have a little racial justice problem. So going back to the Yale Climate Center polls, we know that people of color and particularly women of color are most likely to be alarmed. But here's something that's also important. Those same people of color who are alarmed are also more willing to take action or be part of some kind of campaign. So that means they're willing to call a congressperson, who knows, maybe jump in a rally, that would be really cool. But here's the kicker from the polls. Those folks have not been asked to do so. Well, what's going on? We got a whole entire cult people who care about the climate crisis the most and are willing to talk about it and take action the most, but nobody's asking them to take action. Like, why haven't we as a climate movement done outreach in culturally relevant ways to all the people who are eager and willing to act. Well, according by an interesting new report by um, Dr. Dorsetta Taylor, who's out of the Yale School of the Environment, and this literally just came out last month, when it comes to support for climate advocacy, we absolutely have a racial justice and equity problem. Get this, this is gonna really bug you out. So Dr. Taylor did an analysis just last month and she looked at $4.9 billion given to environmental advocacy over the past three years. Three years, $4.9 billion. Why aren't we free then already? <laughs> like, shouldn't we be free at this point? So yes, that when I actually heard it, it really bowled me over, which is why I'm talking about it now. And of course, in her analysis, only a very small fraction of that money went to environmental justice organizations, and there aren't enough environmental justice organizations, or organizations that work with people of color or just do organizing and focus on those issues. In fact, more money went to one prominent big green organization, who I won't name to pick on them because they're all big and get a lot of money, than all of the social justice and EJ organizations combined. So, I almost fell out, 4.9 billion, like I said, we should be free by now. If, if that's the kind of money that's going into this, I don't understand why we're not free. So we have a new movement, we have a cultural misinformation problem, we have a racial justice and equity problem. So what does this all have to do with community-owned energy systems? Okay, I'm, coming, I'm getting there, I'm coming back around to this. I promise y'all I'm not gonna leave this alone, okay. so. In New York, um, I'm gonna start by talking a bit about New York, because that's where I do a ton of work. So we have made substantive strides towards more just um, energy and climate policy. And this is largely due to the advocacy community. And in 2014, there was a big mass mobilization, the People's Climate March. Was anybody know about that or even there? I'm lo we love to see it, yes, we love to see it. I was there and I always, I always say that because dollars to donuts, somebody in a room was either there, I think I already talked this part, or heard about it. And so, you know, our mass mobilizations are important. So anyway, in New York, after the People's Climate March, a bunch of folks in New York were like, how can we take this momentum and like really change the way we do, you know, climate policy in New York State. So folks came together, built a coalition, and in 2019, we passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, Whoop, whoop, which has both strong EJ provisions and a very ambitious climate mandate. Now, this includes a climate justice um, investment frame where a goal of 40% of the benefits of state climate spending must be done in frontline communities. And also, 
that spending must not do harm to frontline communities. And so this also, and I always say this, Will knows this, I always say this, because this, this what, what we did in New York was the state corollary for what is now a federal environmental justice initiative called the Justice 40, which has a similar concept, does not have a do no harm provision and is problematic in many other ways we could talk about. Um, but I only like to say it because local action matters. And so pursuant to that law, we had a climate action council to create the plan for how the state will um, reach its greenhouse gas emissions goals. And I was appointed to that council. And I like to say, it took me, like me as legal support of a direct action in 2019, you know, give us the CLCPA to pass a whole entire law, the CLCPA that demanded a climate action council and happened to have a whole entire black woman leader, Andrea Stewart Cousins, who is the Senate majority leader in New York state, to appoint the only woman of color to that entire body, right? Like, I, only power is people power. Look, we do it the hard way like the Mandalorian. Doesn't he do things the hard way? I love that show. I can't wait. I have one waiting for me. He, sorry, segue. Mandalorian, he shows up, right? He's like, can you help me do something? And I presume somebody here has seen the show. I hope so, otherwise. Can you help me out? I got this mission. And somebody's always like, yeah, Mando, I will help you. But first, I need you to help me like save this whole entire planet, kick out the empire. And then after you do that, then I will help you with what you want. And he's always like, all right, let's do it. But you know, he makes friends when he does things the hard way. Anyway, keeping it moving. So we put a, a lot of good things came out of that climate action plan. The fossil fuel industry ultimately did not vote for it. There we are looking to shut down fossil fuel facilities in frontline communities. We've got a good definition of who the frontline communities are, who should be getting these benefits. That definition was created by our local um, EJ activists. Um, yet the scale of what needs to happen in New York, like particularly in the building sector, like we're talking billions of dollars and it's a bonanza for the utilities. And it's a bonanza for the energy companies and we want, oh, welcome, welcome says. We want our, you know, clean energy companies to come in and, um, you know, make money. But in, in fighting for this implementation, there's tension in terms of market share. And so we got clean energy companies coming in. We got the utilities. We have the federal government giving money. And so where's the, the community-owned piece? Like, who's jumping in to, like, force that conversation? And to be honest with you, I have yet to see the model of community-owned renewables truly flourish. Be, you know, and the reason remains the utility business model. Um, in most cases, utilities are given permission to be the sole service provider in any particular service territory, and they're given this monopoly control in exchange for just providing universal service to everyone. I mean, that's how the system, you know, has basically been, and the utility is not incentivized to cede that market share, they're just not. Now, every jurisdiction in the U.S. is a little different. Um, in some jurisdictions, the utility owns the entire system um, and has a vertical monopoly in addition to having a, you know, a service territory monopoly. And in some jurisdictions like New York, that's not the case. The utility is not allowed to own the power plants and the distribution system. But still, in my observation, um, progress on community-owned systems has been stalled. Um, and I have done this work for 10 years. I've done it in Illinois, Hawaii, New York, um, California. I have yet to see it truly flourish. And this is where I hope to bring some of these strings together. It's not that we don't have beautiful models for community-owned renewables. We're going to hear more from our, you know, distinguished panels about this. Um, Frontline communities across the country have developed models on how locally owned renewables can provide economic benefits, job benefits. We know that there's room in our economy for community owned renewables, publicly owned renewables, in addition to, you know, privately owned renewables. In fact, you know, the history of American energy, there's been this mix. So there's room in our economy for this. And there are ways to restructure some of these models. I've worked on some of those. I won't get into it, ways that, you know, if a utility can facilitate community-owned renewables, maybe they can get a, an income for doing it, and that kind of can take away some of the pain from seeding that market share that they want to hold on to. But really, I have yet to see, Will, you better be listening now. 
Oh, okay. For some reason, I'm very focused on that. Um, <laughs> what's really lacking is the political will to make the change happen, the political will to break the monopoly when it's in the public interest, when it's in the public interest to invest in a modern grid that's clean, decentralized, and focused on prioritizing investments in the communities that have been laughing. I'm like watching Will like I'm the teacher. That's a grown man. You can read your emails. I ain't gonna say nothing more about that. Sorry. Okay, so we want to be investing in the communities that have been historically disinve disinvested in because energy and environmental justice means energy investments done, done in a way that supports community self-determination, among other things. And so what I really hope is that we can have an emergent climate movement that takes stock of its history and really thinks about how to determine its future. Um, that future, in my humble opinion, should be focused on solidarity, equity, and justice. I happen to believe that it's only through multiracial organizing and education can we build these cultures of awareness that can guide us through this misinformation to practical common sense and everyday action of building new energy systems together. And I can't emphasize how important culture and creative ideas are to our movements. I know that many of us feel tremendous anxiety now that we're in this known world of the climate crisis. And I agree, it is very scary. Um, but it's important to remember that the future that we fear is actually the present for a lot of people in this country and also throughout the world, through the global south, drought, lack of food, wars that have been caused by water, um, water scarcity, high temperatures. So um, amid the fear, I really ask folks to take heart in the ability to imagine a world that's different. You know, Wakanda forever. <laughs> and realize the power and the privilege that we have now, not to just like want to perpetuate the unsustainable lifestyles that we have, but to make new and better ones. And it's hard, look, right? Like I flew a plane, I ate salmon for lunch and it was so good, I was so hungry after a Greenpeace camp. You know, it's not easy, um, but be a joyful futurist as much as you can. I want you to be radical, in your courage. Um, don't think of the movement as a solid thing that you somehow need to join. And don't you take orders. Don't take no orders. Um, ask forgiveness and not permission. Center frontline communities, center frontline communities, that's the one thing, center frontline communities. Empower people to talk to each other, to sing, to tweet, and TikTok. <laughs> which I stopped doing because it was taking over my life when I'm too old, to, to make the change. So after all, I started this song, this, this talk with the Prince 1999 song for a very specific reason. The first being that I'm an auntie and I am a Prince stan. You know, Purple Army come through. <laughs> But the other is that it's an example of a futurist vision, you know, one where we can all find a little bit of funky joy in the impending apocalypse, hello? And like, was it really so bad? Was it so bad? You know, so with that, I want to go ahead and close with what we activists say all the time, but we're going to do it like low key because I know people are studying. It's a very stressful time we're dealing with right now. But what, so we're gonna do a slightly low key, not like if we were out in the street or whatever. Um, but I'm gonna ask you a question. And the answer to that question is climate justice. And um, when do you want it? And I think you'll get that. And then if we don't get it, the answer is we gonna shut it down. Okay, just in case anybody didn't know about it, I don't want you to feel like, you know. All right. Usually, all right, we're gonna yell just a little bit. <laughs> what do we want? When do we want it? Now. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. If we don't get it, what will we do? If we don't get it, shut it down. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. What happened? 
What happened? What happened to our chant? <laughs> when do we want it? Now. If we don't get it, what are we going to do? Now. All right. <laughs> I don't know, y'all. Look, I just came from the camp and everything. That could have been a little smoother. But at any rate, I wanted to, to you know, we'll close and put a little bit of, like, Queen Bee on because it's funky. And I just, um, I want to thank everybody so much. And, yeah, what happened to the champ? Thank everybody so much. And I can't wait to hear about our panel. What's coming up next? <laughs> Do you want that one? Or? Uh, I can. You, okay. I think you can take that. I'll take it for these guys. You guys know the dance? Oh. No, I don't know. Okay, listen. Maybe not. Awesome. <laughs> amazing. Thank you so, so much, Raya, for that amazing talk, for those points of inspiration. I want to be clear to everybody that um, we're going to do Q&A after this panel, and Raya is going to make her way back up here. So please save your questions. Uh, make sure that you uh, come to the... I know there were a few people that had some questions, actually, for all of our panelists, so hoping that you get to ask those about energy justice, environmental justice, social justice, all of the justices, they're all interconnected. Um, and that's kind of the, the thought process for this panel here. Um, so just an introduction, I am Cameron Oglesby. I'm a master of public policy student here. I've been working on environmental justice work at Duke for six years, what? <laughs> It's been too long. And part of that work has been working with Angela and with William on environmental justice storytelling, oral history work, and generally event planning. I've had the pleasure of working with them for a year, a year plus, two years, I don't know, <laughs> three years. I've known you guys for a minute now. So I'm um, really excited to be able to dive into energy justice, environmental justice from a North Carolina perspective specifically. We have two amazing, fabulous uh, EJ advocates that work in North Carolina sitting with us today. So I'm going to introduce them briefly. I want you all to give them a round of applause, and then we'll dive into some questions. <laughs> um, first off, we'll start with William. William J. Barber III is the founder and CEO of the Rural Beacon Initiative, a social enterprise that leverages deployed projects to increase community ownership in the clean energy and regenerative agriculture supply chain. So what Raya had alluded to, that community ownership of, of renewable energy. Uh, William grew up in eastern North Carolina, where under the tutelage of his father, Bishop William J. Barber II, and his mother, Rebecca Barber, he developed an early age, at an early age a deep commitment to social justice and environmental stewardship. He now works as an environmental and climate justice scholar and advocate with nearly a decade of social justice organizing experience and deep academic training in both the science and the law behind environmental and climate issues. And I know both William and Rye are actually on the same environmental justice board, right, with the coalition of Green Capital. So they know each other. Um, I also want to introduce the amazing Angela Dunstan. Okay. <laughs> um, Angela grew up on the border of rural Warren County in Virginia. She began her training as a social justice advocate and environmental steward during the birth of the environmental justice movement in Warren County. Her lived experience fueled her desire to continue to advocate against injustice and for impoverished and marginalized communities across the country. Angela is the Director of Community Engagement and Advocacy for Dunstan Leadership Consulting, is a, is a board member for the League of Conservation Voters, and uh, the Network Engagement Manager for the North Carolina Rural Center. Can we get a round of applause for William and Angela? <laughs> awesome. So I just gave y'all really short introductions. I think there's a lot more to you guys. I would love to have you tell us about yourselves, your work, and your connection to the environmental justice movement. Maybe we can we can start over here and move to Angela. Sounds good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good, good afternoon, everyone. We'll do a little better. There we go. There we go. Um, let me first just, uh, can we get another round of applause for our climate auntie and her keynote? Um, as you all can see, she ribs ribbed me quite often. So, you know, uh, it is it is good that we can have humor in this work. Um, I was taking notes. I was taking notes. Um, um, uh, but as mentioned, my name is William J. Barber III. I am a North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina native. Uh, I come to this work really uh, through four generations. Um, 
uh, of course, you know, my own activism, uh, the activism of my father, Bishop William J. Barber II of the Poor People's Campaign, uh, with many are familiar uh, of. Uh, however, many don't know that one of his first social organizing experiences was actually challenging the dumping of toxic waste in Martinsville, Virginia, behind uh, a poor uh, a black affordable housing complex. Uh, my grandfather, William J. Barber Sr., uh, who was an activist and advocate in his own right, uh, of Eastern North Carolina helped to integrate the schools in Martin and Washington counties, um, but was also, I've learned recently, um, present at the protests in Warren County in 1982. Uh, and then my grand, great grandfather, uh, Benjamin uh, Luther Keyes, was actually a participant in the Battle of Blair Mountain. And if any of you all are students of history, you know that was one of the nation's largest. Uh, labor uprisings in cold country, uh, America. Um, but it provides an interesting uh, juxtaposition for me as how justice has always been at the center of kind of our energy conversation in the country. Um, you know, I come through this work, uh, you know, really recognizing uh, I'm a big data nerd, right? And um, seeing that when we think about 97% of the top 100 counties in the United States that are most impacted by climate change, they're housed in the Southeastern United States according to the National Climate Assessment. And this is data that I learned, you know, doing activities around opposing like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, uh, opposing the Mountain Valley Pipeline, really my first forays into this concept of environmental justice, um, but really seeing that as an inlet into this broader picture of climate crisis that is impacting the communities, you know, that I'm from, that, I'm, that, that, that I come from. What was interesting for me uh, is that, you know, the communities that I grew up in were never uh, these areas of the front lines, you know. I, I just grew up in them, and there were incredible stories of ingenuity, of genius, of entrepreneurship, but all of a sudden, they became the front lines of this global crisis without us even knowing, <laughs> without us even knowing. And, you know, I think it has always been a part of my work to make sure that even as we see these areas being impacted by this uh, 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 global conversation, this global crisis, this global catastrophe, uh, that we recognize those are not, that impact is not the full extent of these communities' story. They are incredible stories of genius, incredible stories of resilience that we have to tap into in this moment as we're seeking global climate solutions. And so that's some of the work we try to do. Yeah. So let me start by saying uh, good afternoon. Thank you to Dean Kelly, to Raya, to Cameron, to my uh, friend William, and to each of you for being here. It says something that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to um, take a moment to hear about the stories of what is happening and hopefully at the end of this, figure out a way to engage and be a part of the fight for clean energy, environmental justice, and efforts to help those who sometimes are deemed as the least of these. As Cameron said, I am from uh, Warren County, and for those of you who are not familiar with the area, it's in the northeastern region of the state on the border between North Carolina and Virginia. I grew up in the 80s. No, I don't look my age, don't say it anyway. Um, no, but I grew up in the 80s, and I always say I cut my teeth on the environmental justice movement. Um, I was... Uh, protesting alongside my aunts, my grandmothers, and so many other powerful women in Warren County who were fighting for something. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but I knew we were fighting for something that was just and something that was right. And so just to give you a quick bit of the story of how Warren County became deemed the birthplace of the environmental justice movement in America, um, in the 1970s, a unscrupulous uh, chemical company dumped PCB along the side of the road in eastern North Carolina. And when the state of North Carolina decided to dig this soil up and to house it somewhere, there were 90 sites in the state of North Carolina that was chosen 
And it came down to two, Warren County, which was predominantly African-American, which is, which was and still is a tier one high poverty county in the state and Chatham County. So is anybody familiar with Chatham County? Do you know about all the things that are happening in Chatham County right now? So Chatham County is the economic bus. So VinFast, um, all kinds of energy production companies are coming to Chatham County. So we often say, what if Warren County hadn't become the dumping site for this PCB soil? Would we now be the Chatham County of North Carolina? But nevertheless, Warren County was chosen as the site to dump the PCB soil, and it's a cancerous, toxic chemical that many individuals we believe in the county died from various cancers, had many birth defects, uh, many other health issues that we, we believe stem from having PCB dumped in our county. Long story short, the people of Warren County and many other areas in the state of North Carolina and across the country came to Warren County to protest the dumping of this toxic soil in our backyard. Unfortunately, Warren County didn't prevail. We became the home of the landfill. Um, but regardless of the fact that we lost the battle, we still say we won the war because, because of the work that we did in Warren County, communities all across the state and all across the country realize that sometimes Goliath doesn't have to win. You can protest even if in the end of the day we became the site and so we affect, affectionately take the title of the birth of the environmental justice movement in America, and we are still working to this day to um, recover from the ill effects of having PCB dumped in our community. And um, didn't know this about your granddad. Uh, again, I was a, a, a young person at that time, but William and I became connected through our work with the NAACP fighting against environmental justice issues and many other social justice issues that are currently happening or that were happening and are still happening in our state and across our country. Thank you both so much. Honestly, I learned something new about, about both of you too. And just hearing about these deep-seated connections, I, I, I think it's really fascinating. I know I have my own personal deep-seated connections to the environmental justice movement as well in my family, these ancestries, right? These cycles, it's, it's really affirming to hear these histories. Um, I would love to transition us to some of the issues that you guys just talked about and characterize the issues facing North Carolinians with regard to energy justice and environmental justice today. So where do you guys think the priority areas are? And it would be lovely if you could allude to your own work. I know, William, we really want to hear about the Rural Beacon Initiative and how you're addressing issues in rural eastern North Carolina. Um, so I'm opening it up there. And either maybe Angela goes first this time. <laughs> I don't want to take the um, mic from you, even though you, you have one. Um, one of the areas that I'm working in right now is in rural North Carolina. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar with, or hopefully if you aren't, the issues that rural North Carolina face right now. Um, issues around lack of access to broadband, um, lack of access to quality health care, uh, the disparity when it comes to the quality of education, that exist in East, well, in, in rural North Carolina, but, but more specifically in Eastern North Carolina, the issues that those areas face with hurricanes, floods, and other disasters. Um, Eastern North Carolina and Western North Carolina has never recovered from many of the floods and hurricanes that have happened, you know, years ago. I was recently in Robeson County in Lumberton, North Carolina, and um, we went down to visit the Tar River or the Lumbee River. And nice, wonderful, sunny day just like this. The river is already at the bank and there's no water. You know, there hasn't been a flood yet. But even with, with, with that, those folks are still facing the changes that need to happen from, you know, being impacted by floods that happened in 1999, floods that happened in the 80s. They're still trying to recover from the ill effects of those, the environmental issues that come along with that, the health issues that, that come along with that as well. And so for me, because rural North Carolina is special to me because that's where I'm from, my work has centered around how do we help those communities 
acquire not only the resources, but the skills, the tools, and the knowledge to change the effects of what's happening there and to have not only state government come in to help them, but how do they as the community themselves implement solutions that they have, that they just sometimes need resources and other um, access to funds to implement those changes. So for me, that's one area that I'm specifically working on right now. How do we help rural North Carolina? Um, love that. And, you know, to build on that, I want to start with the general and then get into some of the specific work that we're trying to do, attempting to do. Uh, generally, you know, when you talk about just taking a walk in history, when you talk about the environmental justice crisis that happened in Warren County, we have to also recognize that that crisis was only made possible because of the environmental crisis of Love Canal that happened years prior and what was perceived as an environmental success in terms of nav managing and litigating how those PCBs were actually distributed or, I mean, excuse me, disposed of. However, there were blind spots when we talked about the impact it would have downstream on frontline communities. And I start there generally because we have to understand that in terms of environmental policy, climate policy, our movement has always wrestled with these blind spots about what the impacts, the benefits are going to be on the communities who are not necessarily front of mind. So that's generally, you know, a challenge that we continue to kind of keep uh, forefront and try to navigate and hold true. Um, specifically, you know, we are working um, in a number of areas. In addition to the gaps of access uh, that Angela, you know, laid out, uh, there are also gaps in terms of the perceived benefits. You know, we are living in a post-Inflation Reduction Act world where we see unprecedented amounts of investments going into clean energy projects. We're in living in a post-Justice uh, 40 world where there is at least a directive to have unprecedented amounts of investments going into frontline communities, rural communities, uh, coastal communities. However, we're also living in a world where the reality are there have been gaps in terms of the knowledge curve for these communities to actually show up and take advantage of these funds and resources, the trust curve for communities to be able to have relationships with trusted partners, uh, financial intermediaries, uh, developers to actually deploy projects, uh, and in terms of the overall community infrastructure to allow capital that is made available to not just be a one-time cash infusion, but to actually recycle in these areas and create real long-term opportunity. These are all gaps and challenges that exist in the front lines and areas where we are now uh, as a society, as a nation, really looking to try to uh, 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 deploy. Uh, and then there's a further disparity in terms of the racial disparity where black and brown people, indigenous people writ large, have not had access to these conversations to be able to take their part, take their role in leadership of incentives, of initiatives that actually redress some of these issues. And so... Uh, in many ways, as we see this boom of opportunity in the green economy, uh, as we see this real need for more ingenuity and entrepreneurship driven for pe by people from the local uh, front lines, there's a real gap there. And so the work that we do at Rural Beacon Initiative, uh, as Cameron mentioned, is designed to uh, increase ownership, diversity, uh, through our demonstrative uh, 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 deployed projects. Uh, we are retrofitting a 52-acre a former homestead in a historic community of color uh, into what we have called a demonstrative sustainability hub pilot, comprising elements of regenerative agriculture, uh, sustainable agroforestry, and agrivoltaics. Uh, we're doing this for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, the education and awareness, demonstrating to the local community about what are some of the possibilities of uh, that are arising in this new economy. People cannot take advantage if they're not aware. People cannot take advantage if they are not aware. And so we are really working deeply to educate communities, to answer their questions, to uh, uh, push back against some of the propaganda where, uh, you know, there have been companies that have said solar is bad for the soil of black landowners and, you know, it's going to pollute their soil or run their land values down. We are doing that work of talking with communities and creating those dialogues. Number two, uh, we are innovating with partners, uh, including uh, 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 financial innovators and CDFIs, a CDFI partner, on ways that we can scale this work up the through the first door of access being capital. How do we get capital to flow to people in these areas? What does that look like? Um, 
And, you know, in doing that, we are taking some uh, looks at issues like uh, black land loss that has been pervasive uh, throughout the region, uh, heirs property, of course, issues where people may not be able to develop or take advantage of developing because, they're you know, people don't know who owned the land, <laughs> you know, who, who owns the land. And so we're looking at addressing that. Um, and we are also looking at addressing issues like local food insecurity when we talk about the food access hub. Uh, so all of these are real world issues. And I think it's important to recognize that communities don't experience issues on a singular basis. They don't experience a poverty issue on Monday, a racial justice issue on Tuesday, a environmental and climate issue on Wednesday, a uh, uh, you know energy burden issue on, on, on Thursday. They experience all of these issues real time. And so in that vein, recognizing that, we are really embracing the fact that we need a whole of societal approach uh, when we're talking about really benefiting these communities for the long term. Thank you both for such robust answers. And I think it's a perfect segue actually into this question of uh, the current moment. And I, we're a room full of policy students, I, or there's some MEMs in here. There's a lot of different people in here. But um, us as people interacting with environmental policy and energy policy, how we can go about maximizing our impact, uh, what is it, prioritizing frontline communities, doing all of this work and aiding the work that you guys are doing on the ground. So Raya alluded to the Justice 40 initiative and how it's inadequate. Uh, <laughs> you, you also spoke to it, William. Um, and in this moment of unprecedented emphasis and commitment to climate justice, uh, addressing climate change, environmental justice through Justice 40, the creation of the, the new EPA Department of Environmental Justice, both of you were at the announcement last semester when the EPA announced a new Department of Environmental Justice. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, like there's, there's been a lot, you said that. Um, and it sounds like it hasn't quite been reaching people. How, how, what's the question here? What, what is, what is your vision, I suppose, for energy access, for energy justice, environmental justice? Um, and as a point of accountability, maybe for the people in this room, where do you see the greatest need for improvements, uh, especially from perhaps us as people entering these climate spaces, these policy spaces? Yeah. Um, I think the first point in terms of access is we cannot segregate the present moment. We cannot divorce that from the history of movement and academia and struggle that got us here. Like we have to recognize that the possibility of even a Justice 40 is only a direct result of the protesters in Warren County. It's only a direct result of, you know, the decades and the multi-generational efforts of people making sure that frontline communities, climate and environmental justice, that these frameworks, energy justice, as Raya, you know, is an expert on, that these frameworks are uh, uh, pushed forward and made clear in our environmental policy. So that's number one. We cannot see this present moment in a silo. Um, number two, uh, I, you know, strongly emphasize, uh, re-emphasize what I said earlier, the knowledge and trust curve when we talk about uh, 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 this information reaching communities. Um, we need to, just like we're creating policy and infrastructures to deploy clean projects, um, some of the work that we're engaged on, Ryan and I both, in terms of the Green Bank work, is how do we create the infrastructures so that capital recycles, but also the, the, the preliminary infrastructure of just the knowledge flow that people are aware. How do we engage communities early and often, thinking about listening sessions, educational tours, things that break through the fact that communities on the ground literally do not know what this means, what this moment means. There are communities right now where people are looking and talking, you know, and, and trying to prioritize for deployment that have no idea we're having these conversations right now. And so as simple as it seems, you know, that educational component is really key because it does a few things. It one, you know, broad awareness is necessary, especially if we're thinking about rapid and broad adoption of clean energy products and projects. People are not going to necessarily go out of their way and perceivingly, you know, inconvenience themselves um, if they don't know what the benefit is to them, the people they care about or the planet. How do you get, you know, Grandma Sue to open up her home and have uh, her gas water heater, natural gas water heater? That's been working for years. How do you get her comfortable to retrofit that with a heat pump unless you tell her, hey, this is going to be good for 
your uh, 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 indoor health. It's going to be good for the environment. And guess what? We're going to do it for you in a more in, a, in an affordable way where your energy bill is lower. Like these are real conversations that we have to have with communities. And so that's why the educational component is so crucial. Number two, that entrepreneurship and ingenuity um, that I mentioned coming from the front lines, it's only possible if people are aware. It's only possible if people are aware, are educated, and have the opportunity to develop partnerships and new models and to play their part. Uh, I say often that, you know, we, when, when in this conversation around justice or equity, especially in climate solutions, we often talk a good game around workforce development, which is an important piece of it. But we are talking about a multi-trillion dollar global economy. And to talk about that reality, that amount of capital, that type of uh, economy, and to only think about the role of frontline communities and communities that have historically been segregated from these conversations, to only think of them as workforce and not owners and entrepreneurs, I say it's a, well, it's a form of well-paid apartheid. And so we have to think about how are we positioning communities not only to participate, to benefit, to be new customers, but to actually own, to compete, to innovate. And then finally, I would say, you know, you know, right here in North Carolina, we, we are in the midst of, uh, of course, many of you may know a conversation right now around uh, our utility rate hike, which has, you know, real world implications for disposable incomes for, you know, uh, 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 families that are already overly energy burdened um, and, you know, real has, has real world implications in terms of how communities and how people can actually engage in the uh, 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 decision making infrastructure there, like the Public Utilities Commission. So. I'll say ditto to everything <laughs> that William just said. Um, and, and you literally took a lot of the points I had, and I'm glad you. I'm sorry. Already, no, that's all right. <laughs> I'm glad you've already um, raised them. But the one that makes the one that's really harping on my heart right now is the fact that we have the IRA Act. We've got Justice 40. But how are the people who've been directly impacted by these issues? How are they going to benefit from this unheard of opportunity that exists currently? And as I think about the communities that I work with, that auntie, that grandma, who's not going to let Cameron in her front door because she does not know Cameron. But she may let an Angela in the door because she does know Angela. So it's that issue of trust and building relationships and then using those relationships to help those communities understand the real benefit of what this can mean. And you're right. Not just workforce development, but what about entrepreneurship opportunities? What about opportunities to engage in clean energy and to own clean energy uh, companies and organizations? And then taking that information even further for me and educating the next generation of individuals who will benefit from this. And I'm, I may be jumping a little bit ahead, but I would like for the Sanford School to think about how do we use people like one of my favorite students, Andrew, to help work on the ground to make a difference in, in many of those communities and how we partner and build relationships that are black, brown, white, and indigenous to bring about change in those communities? Can I? Yeah. yeah, a few quick, because you got me on a soapbox. <laughs> um, you know, I think some other concerns as we think about climate and environmental policy writ large is how is that term of benefits defined? And not just defined by, you know, we don't, sh we should not define it based on the outcomes that are readily available. Like, okay, it's defined that everybody benefits from clean energy, right? We know that. But when you talk about that grandma or that auntie, what is the actual benefit that she can tangibly say changed my life? Are we thinking about lowering energy bills and, you know, increasing more disposable income and that translating to, you know, opportunities for wealth generation and economic resilience? Are we thinking about uh, how do we make sure that, uh, 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 of course, in policies like the greenhouse gas reduction uh, uh, fund, it looks at the lowering of emissions but the adjacent benefits to health and to uh, issues like childhood asthma that have disproportionate rates for black and brown children. Uh, are we thinking about uh, the, 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 the resilience that is necessary in the long term as black and brown and indigenous and, and, and poor white people are forced out of urban centers 
because of in current inflation, where are they going to go? So uh, the opportunity and the benefit to build in a way that actually thinks about housing people, like populations, entire populations of people that have been impacted by this current crisis. So we really have to think about how are we defining benefits in a way that is is really benefits and not just what's easily attainable. And I think we have to also think in terms of our policy, how do we hold uh, 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 policies accountable to those communities? If the benefits that we say we want to achieve are not happening, what is the recourse? How do we course correct? How do communities have a voice in what that looks like? Um, and then uh, you mentioned something about the next generations, which I think is so important, is, you know, this work is not going to happen only in our generation. Mm -hmm nor is it going to happen only in one specific sector. The crisis that we're facing, that we're avoiding, because I believe we're going to avoid it, don't y'all? Uh, the crisis that we're avoiding is of such a scale that no singular sector can solve it on its own. So you need to think about how do we uh, uh, infuse into our current academic study and training a whole of sectoral uh, intersectional approach Academia can't solve it on its own. Social justice organizing can't solve it on its own. Finance can't solve it on its own. Technological innovation cannot solve it on its own. So we really have to make sure that we are seeding the next generation of thinkers in a way to think about that whole of societal approach to use all of the tools that we have at our disposal at our disposal and not just to be siloed to one specific one. If I can add a quick thought, this is y'all's show, but it just got me thinking. <laughs> um, I know the perspective I'm coming to this from is as is more a storyteller and a journalist, and that really hit on the educational points, I think, in the bringing up of the next generation even. And I know it's it's a bit of a balancing act, entering communities when you don't belong to those communities, no matter how many points of residence you might feel. When we went to Piney Woods a couple weeks ago, I'm like, dang, these people, I was talking to Lillian, who I don't know where she is, but um, she was talking about how uh, this person looks like my grandma. This person acts like my my uncle. Like those those points of resonance, it's, it's really interesting entering these spaces when you don't belong and trying to do good. And I think that's sort of the situation we as students are facing. It, in North Carolina, or if we're entering another community in the US South, um, we are not necessarily a member of those community communities. So how do we go about going in and doing our best and trying to do good? And I felt that that has been as a journalist and as a storyteller and as oral historian working with, with you guys to tell your stories to journalism, literally interviewing Raya like a couple weeks ago for an article about the IRA and the climate impact. And so I, I'm just, I think my next question, and I want to bring Raya up here to engage in the Q&A as well. I think this is a question for you too. Raya, is if you have thoughts for us as outsiders, um, as people that uh, don't belong to those community, these communities, but may be able to contribute resources to, you know, just give you all the money and let you do your thing or to come in as a journalist or a storyteller or something or other, um, where you think the, the points of greatest impact might be for us as people who don't belong to these communities. I know you've spoken to some of those points, but I really want to hit it home for as an action point for the people in this room, as somebody who's been in your shoes and is hoping to pass the baton to people that are interested in environmental justice to work with the Angelas and the Williams and the Rias of the world. So if I could just invite Raya up here really quick uh, <laughs> to uh, switch to Q&A. Um, but while she's coming, of uh, Cameron, I, I will just also say, um, I think an example of how that has worked is when the Duke students came to Warren County for the 40th anniversary, well, the 40th recognition of the environmental justice movement. And all of you brought skills that some of us didn't have, whether it was storytelling, whether it was helping us to organize, whether it was bringing and making awareness to others about the issue. I think that's how you fit in, in, a, in a community that I wouldn't, wouldn't say you don't belong, but that you're new to the community. But you come with an open heart and understanding that I may not know this community from being born here or having relatives here, but I'm coming here to make a difference. And so for me, we were so appreciative of what the Duke students, also Carolina, because I'm a Carolina alum, let's get that right. Also the Carolina students brought as well and appreciated that because you helped us be able to do the work on the ground 
but again, bring awareness, education, and help to inform others about what was happening in our community. So. I, I, well, you basically said everything that needed to be said, and I'll just add that 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 is something when you are building this expertise, you are indeed building something that can add value. Um, just like yep. just like she said, and so be cognizant of that, and that's something that you can use to contribute. Um, yeah, I'll build on that. Quick shout out to Attorney David Neal in the rafters there. He gave me my first uh, legal internship, so glad to see him here. Um, I think you know, building on that that concept of adding value, and conversely, not being extractive, like not just showing up to a community to see what can we take out? Can we take the stories out? Can we take out capital? Can we take uh, 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 out, you know, uh, a new customer base for clean products? Like, you know, what can we infuse into communities? It's just on a principle, a really important piece. Um, I think for me, you know, I harp on the educational and the awareness components. You know, people, it is hard for people to imagine what they cannot see. And so, you know, I really focus on opportunities um, where people can add, you know, communities know their realities and their needs the best, but sometimes they need a little help and assistance to see what the solutions I might be or to expand their reality. And so, you know, what are opportunities uh, in our networks to expose people to new technologies that can have real world impacts? You know, we are innovating at an incredible weight, um, you know, everything from atmospheric water generation to, uh, you know, high, more high efficient uh, uh, agrivoltaic uh, practices. These can really benefit communities, but they have no idea. How can we expose them to these technologies in a way that they see the possibilities and they see not only the possibilities that are happening abroad, but they see real direct solutions to problems that they are facing day in and day out. I would also, uh, you know, reframe slightly that, um, you know, I liked what you said, Angela, not, you know, not necessarily not belonging to communities, but, but being new to a community, you know, recognize that every one of us here has some type of connection, direct connection to the frontline communities we're talking about. You may have to go back a few generations, but for the most part, most of us have some type of connection. And so just keeping that in mind, as you all are thinking to engage in a way that is not extractive, that is more what can we infuse and how can we expose communities to a paradigm, to realities, to solutions that meet their needs that they see day in and day out. Say that's, I, I would also add that sometimes, like me, sometimes things are awkward <laughs> and that's okay. You know, like we're trying to do things that haven't been done before and cross barriers that haven't been crossed. That's right. I want to invite everybody to come up if you have questions. Um, I know there were some people, I'm pretty sure Andrew, Ian, I'm going to call you out. If you have questions, <laughs> encourage you to come to the, the podium here and ask them of our, of our panelists. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you out by your day. Thank you all so much for, for being here and for the work that you've put into the world. Um, as Cameron mentioned, my name is Ian Hitchcock. The frontline community I come from is rural Wyoming, uh, a place where a lot of people view their entire beings, their story of themselves through the lens of the fossil fuel economy. And when we talk about a just transition, I know that in the work that I'm trying to do in the climate movement, I'm essentially trying to take the jobs away from the people I went to high school with that went into the oil fields, right? Because I know that needs to be done, but I also don't want those people to be left behind. So I'm wondering, as we're thinking about what the just transition looks like, not only for the frontline communities that have borne the worst impacts of those kinds of ways of getting energy, but also those people who have a hard time seeing themselves in any other way other than as oil workers and as rubbernecks. Um, what, what would you say to the people I went to high school with that are resisting, fighting tooth and nail, anything that screams climate action because they're afraid that it's going to take away the only economic security they've ever known? That's, that's an excellent question. And it's something that I think we really have to wrestle with collectively as a movement. Um, you know, we need all the allies, including unlikely allies we can get. Um, 
I've done, you know, some recent work down in the Gulf Coast and visiting with people in the uh, Petro Corridor in Houston, Cancer Alley, as Ryan mentioned, in Louisiana. And, you know, I think there are two narratives that the communities were leading as they were trying to engage with workers. Um, the first was that, um, you know, it's really critical that people understand they should not have to die to make a living. And what I mean by that is, you know, I imagine that those same workers that you were talking about who are just trying to make an honest living, trying to provide for their family, that there are also cases of many health issues that they are experiencing from these toxic exposures, you know, generation to generation. And that's a real question that, you know, I think we as allies need to do to expose their realities. Like, you should not have to die to make a living. You should not have to die to provide for your family. I think that leads to my second point in question, which would be, you know, we really have to challenge that oftentimes these communities have been siloed into one type of economic opportunity, one type of industry because of the impact the fossil fuel industry has on those communities. When it comes in and pollutes these areas, you know, other opportunities, other economic engines are not attracted, other service opportunities. So, you know, we really have to say that as we're looking to transition and clean up uh, uh, our economy, you know, it really doesn't shrink the pie. It actually grows the pie for new opportunities that don't have as many impacts where you don't necessarily have to put your personal health at risk. Uh, and then that's where we have to start the conversation about the education, I think, the retraining opportunities. You know, how do we have deep partnerships with uh, 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 unions like, you know, the Teamsters and others who actually have the skills to help with some of these retrofits? How do we make sure to bring them along and say, see, see us as allies and not necessarily adversaries that are trying to disrupt their uh, ability to make a living? And, and just along those same lines, I was recently at an event um, around innovation and clean energy. And again, just some opportunities that I have never thought about, probably couldn't think about, but ways that clean energy will allow for entrepreneurship, new um, opportunities in workforce development that can happen. So for that community, there's an opportunity to do it. And as William said, not to sacrifice your life, your health, and those who are around you, but to be open to those opportunities and understanding that there's a future to this. And we need to be looking to the future of how we engage in energy, and specifically clean energy. Thank you so much for such insightful, um, thought-provoking answers. I'll add that in New York, we've taken this just transition idea on in a kind of a practical way as part of our climate planning process. We had a just transition working group um, that was made up of labor, other advocates, utilities, you know, utility unions and others, and actually did a study of, you know, what are the jobs that will be impacted? What are the sectors that will be impacted on a, on a level though of like of a community level? Like what does it mean when this plant closes? What will that mean for the school district? What will it mean for the tax base? And then how can we actually change the infrastructure of the government to be able to, you know, actually facilitate what a just transition means by having a, you know, an office of just transition? And can we have a fund, a worker assurance fund that goes with that? Now, these things haven't manifested yet, um, but, you know, there are some approaches that we're using in New York State. Hello. Um, first, thank you for being here. I'm grateful for your, um, all of your words of wisdom. Unfortunately, I missed the very beginning of this. So if anything I ask is part of that, please uh, follow Climate follow Auntie on Instagram. <laughs> Will do. Um, so my name is Jaquel. I'm a second year MPP here. Um, I grew up in Henderson, North Carolina, taught in Warrington, North Carolina. First time I'd ever even learned about the, PP, uh, the dumping. And so one thing I'm really curious about is someone who has a deep level of passion and care for rural communities, especially rural North Carolina, but as someone who does not currently have plans to live in or be directly like within rural communities, I'm just really curious about how you would suggest folks who want to do work to support the particular communities that they're not necessarily living within, how to do that. And especially if folks who are coming outside of the environmental like justice community, but who still want to address this particular issue within those sorts of communities. Yeah. 
Um, no, great question. I think um, in addition to following Climate Auntie, I would say follow Rural Beacon Initiative <laughs> and take a look at the work that we're doing. Um, but more seriously, you know, I think helping to elevate the story of organizations that are trying to do this work and making sure that the voices and the principles and the conversations that you're hearing today are taken forth in spaces where we may not be. You know, that is a huge help because what it does, it, it helps prevent uh, the erasure, right, of these these communities. It helps prevent um, sometimes what is called the attention violence, where we, you know, anonymize these communities and just think about them as like, oh, they're out of sight. They're the rural communities, front lines over there. Like, these are real people. These are real communities. These are real lives. And so the more that we create a chorus of voices um, with diverse experiences, exposures, networks, and skills that are talk talking about these issues, the more that we can see, you know, real significant change. Um, I also think, you know, I don't happen to necessarily uh, live in the community where we're serving. I, I kind of go back and forth, but, you know, maintaining, finding ways to maintain those lines of connection, whether it's, you know, uh, regular visits, we do check-in calls, um, you know, with our community members. Um, you know, we've uh, uh, done, you know, a number of events to really show that we're committed. Uh, like we've brought back the Community Harvest Festival, you know, in the community where we're deploying the farm. They asked us to do that. So we do that twice a year. Um, so just, you know, being creative and maintaining those lines of connection and then being intentional about telling the story of these communities and spaces where you find yourself. But in addition to telling the story, which I 100% agree with, we also have to realize that all of these issues are connected. I mean, it may be directly affecting Warren County right now or Martin County, but those are the same issues that affect you if you're here in Durham, if you're in, you know, um, somewhere in Iowa. They're all interconnected and just realizing that we all have a part to play, a place to be engaged we all volunteer in some way, shape, or form when we have time. So when you do, utilize that time to be able to tell the story, connect to others, provide resources if you have the means to do it, but also to educate others about the issues and how we can make an impact on those. So I think that those are also ways that you can be engaged, even if you don't live in rural North Carolina. I, I will add... Um, only that because of the IRA, there are really unprecedented funds that are coming out. And as William said, the really the local infrastructure isn't there to, you know, you know, for for folks to really come up and even apply for these grants. And so I also just on a practical level suggest that folks, you know, as as students, master students, et cetera, like sign up for some of these alerts that are coming out from the EPA, from the DOE, from the, like there are literally every day there's another like $10 million this, $20 million this. A lot of it is about technical assistance. Um, and so I think that folks in this room may, you know, just start plugging in. It's challenging. I'm, you know, it's challenging for everyone, but st st start signing up and hearing about the things that are going on so that you can plug in, I would suggest. And, and one final place of allyship is... As you all are going to be exposed to numerous opportunities, networks, and platforms that people in frontline communities may not necessarily uh, have readily available, not only telling the story, but challenging the narrative around frontline communities and what we think and how we engage. And that, you know, challenging that these are somehow, you know, passive regions that just, you know, need all of this outside guidance but have no goals no you know infrastructure at all you know of the in of themselves uh challenge that and make sure that you know you're giving voice that communities have to be seen as partners and co-creators in this work and not just i think i said it earlier you know passive recipients or beneficiaries and I got to jump in only because you said communities have to be co-partners in this process. And that was one of the points that I also wanted to make, that we are a part of the decision-making table. It's not just something that someone decides for us, but because we are directly impacted by these issues, we also have solutions. We just need other resources that people may be able to bring to the table to help create those plans of actions, opportunities for engagement. What William is doing in Martin County right now is a prime example of that. Um, I'm doing some work right now with a um, predominantly white 
institution and an HBCU looking at how we can work on issues of environmental justice and social justice. So for Duke, that's an opportunity, should you choose to engage, to do that type of work to help with these types of issues and to be able to address them. And I got to jump in one more time on okay, that. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> and and that, I mean, that's I think that's important, too, as we think about these frameworks of environmental justice, climate justice, and energy justice, that it is not just about the outcomes. It is not just about benefiting communities. There's a procedural element throughout all of those, which means that just as important as the destination is the pathways we take to get there. And community engagement, community inclusion, and the decision-making, the strategizing is key if we're actually looking to, you know, say a solution is, is, is a justice center solution. Fellow New Yorker here. Um, <laughs> um, so not to not to minimize like how you said the lies and everything are kind of how we got here, but I'm kind of obsessed with the idea of like branding and how progressive ideals are never branded properly. Like global warming, not good enough because it sounds oh cool like no big deal climate change sounds even less important you used um climate crisis which i don't know how new or widespread that is it feels like from my knowledge pretty new but i'm just curious like how how intentional like people in the in the movement are being with the terms that they're using for those headlines because i really think that that's a huge reason why we have so many who are especially like um ambivalent because they just don't hear enough of like fear and not that I want people to be motivated by fear, but that's the reality. So, yeah. No, that's a good question. And it gets to this issue of, you know, of culture and building these cultures and reaching out to folks in relevant ways. When was it, was it about five or 10 years ago when I know a lot of active, a lot of activist folks or policy folks said, we're not going to say climate change anymore. We're going to say climate crisis like that. That was an intentional switch that happened several years ago. Um, all I can say is I agree with you. When I talk about this movement being emergent, I say that to empower folks, but not in any way to <laughs> say that it hasn't built upon, you know, the, the, the EJ and other movements that we heard about here. Um, so just there's work to do. There is absolutely work to do in the area of culture, branding, awareness, because just in the four years between um, the Paris Agreement, yeah, just four years after the Paris Agreement, um, the fossil fuel industry put in $5 billion just into just marketing alone. So they are doing a lot of marketing. And even that $4.9 billion that I mentioned in the past three years that went to environmental stuff, I mean, we should be free with all that money, but it still pales the marketing that happens on the other side. And that's why I mentioned that procedural element, because there is a level of discernment that that necessitates because, you know, some industries who have been really extractive have been looking at efforts to address some social justice issues like land loss, mm -hmm. like creating funds to help out with heirs property. But these are also the same industries that are depleting southern forest or, you know, impacting the climate and the environment in other detrimental ways. And so we have to be cognizant, you know, of the uh, 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 the greenwashing campaigns, you know, that are often used to try to kind of cover up uh, the bad actors and that element, that procedural element of really engaging the communities as we assess, is this beneficial? Is this a solution? Is this, you know, working for communities? In some ways that helps us have that collective discernment. I'm gonna jump in. I know we had like three other questions. This conversation has been amazing and enlightening, but um, we are slightly over time. So I wanna make sure that I, before we close out and pass it back to Z and Kelly, make a quick, make a quick plug for on this storytelling note, on this, on this uh, potential Duke partnership note. We're currently working with both William and Angela on what is called the Environmental Justice Oral History Project. That was what I was, uh, that's what I was alluding to earlier when we were working with William in, in uh, his ancestral community of Piney Woods Free Union to collect oral histories, to write articles, to do a mini documentary, just generally to engage and uplift the, the voices of the community that has historically been isolated. And I know we're working with Angela right now on an article about Warren County. Um, the Warren County Environmental Action Team, the Rural Beacon Initiative, these are partnerships that will continue at Duke. We are making that, we're, we're gonna make sure that they continue at Duke 
there will be ways to engage. I know, I mean, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but I got the sense you guys are interested in students being interested in learning more about your communities yeah. and helping and uplifting and supporting. Yeah. Yes. And I know we're really hopeful to maintain a long-term relationship with you, Raya, whether through the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic or some other something at the law school. So I want to put that out to all of you guys. This does not end here. They've given us a real call to action here. I hope that you take it um, in whatever form that looks like. And I want to gracefully pass it back to Dean Kelly to close us out. Thank you so much, Cameron. And it does not end here. There is also a reception upstairs. At least that is a first step towards more climate justice is to go up there and bond with each other, make connections, ask further questions, engage in dialogue. Uh, and before we do that, let's just extend uh, our, our thanks to Cameron and to our distinguished speakers. Thank you so much.